Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Engaging in Self-Care Activities with Kids and Teens, uh, part of our How to Stay Sane During COVID-19 and Virtual School, which started for my kids this week. Uh, I, I'm assuming some others are in the same position, and I know that some people won't be starting until next week. Uh, <clears throat> as always, a few uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, we do have a couple of handouts in here. There's a couple of shameless marketing from the score at the top. There's a couple of things from Therapeutic Oasis. Uh, please feel free to grab them, download them. If you don't see them, send me an email, jason at scoreatt.com, and I can always send them to you. If you have any audio difficulties, again, click on the audio portion of the GoToWebinar um, control panel, and you can dial in by phone. It takes a couple of seconds, but it will probably fix the problem 99 times out of 100. If you have any questions, use the GoToWebinar uh, control panel again, send your questions in online. I will be monitoring them at the end of Alyssa's presentation. Um, she, I, I will come back and ask her any of the questions that you have. I'll go through some of the questions that I have. Um, and so, you know, we'll have that opportunity to have a little discussion. <clears throat> Quick poll just to see what our audience looks like. Let's see here, poll. And just want to see who you are. So if you could take a couple of seconds to get that. Um, we got, we got, we're getting some votes in now. If everyone else can, we get half, about half the votes in. Let's see if we can get a couple more votes and, and we'll call it a day. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> we're at, yeah, we're at 50%. We're at 50%. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going to close it out. So right now we're 50-50 parent and educator. Okay. Uh, we'll just assume that we have some other people in there. <clears throat> so our our presenter today is Alyssa Hickey. Alyssa is a licensed clinical social worker at Therapeutic Oasis of the Treasure Coast and the Palm Beaches. She focuses on creating authentic connections to help children, teens, and adults navigate their healing journey. Alyssa uses her training in trauma-informed care, dialectual behavioral therapy, DBT, and expressive art therapies to help people find hope and build resiliency. Alyssa combines her warmth and genuine approach with her training to join with her clients to create life, a life they want to live. Thank you, Alyssa, for um, coming today and being a part of this series. I'm going to make you the presenter and turn my camera off, and you can take it away from there. Okay. I'm just gonna pull up the presentation. I saw this joke once about um, about how um, like everyone always shares their screen and they're like, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And okay, can everybody see that? And it's like the exact purpose that everyone uses every single time that we present something. <laughs> and then I catch myself doing it all the time. So I'm pretty sure you guys can all see that. So can if you can't, then you're chasing enough. Okay. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about engaging in self-care with kids and teens and kind of looking at what does that look like for different ages, as well as as parents, maybe family members. Um, I didn't go too specifically into educators, but you know, these skills are really going to apply to everyone. So let's see if this actually clicks. The next one. No? There we go. Okay. Oops. So today, like I said, we're going to cover what does self-care really mean, how self-care fits into DBT. So, you know, Jason mentioned that I'm a DBT intensively trained therapist. So dialectical behavioral therapy is a behavior therapy. It's looking at how there are so many different truths in the world that two things can be true at the same time. It's also a mindfulness-based practice. So about really getting in touch with our emotions and how those can affect our behaviors. So sometimes it's emotions lead to behaviors, and sometimes changing our behaviors can change our emotions and thoughts. So DBT kind of looks at all of that. And then, like I said, looking at self-care on every age and then as a family. So this is just a little quote I like to talk about with self-care. I'm sure you guys may have also heard the metaphor, you know, you have to put the mask on yourself before you can put it on someone else in the airplanes. Um, this is pretty similar to that, right? So an empty tank will take you exactly nowhere. Take time to refuel. I hear a lot from, you know, parents and even kids and teens, you know, like, oh, I just don't have any time, right? There's no time in the day. Um, and the fact of the matter is that even if we take five to 10 minutes to engage in some sort of self-care, some sort of moment for ourselves, we can see a lot of mental health benefits. So it's really important to take time 
take care of ourselves, whether that's the beginning of the day, the end of the day. I really try to prioritize my lunch time. It's just like me time and not answering emails or phone calls at lunch, kind of whatever will work for you. But first we have to talk a little bit about what self-care is. So for most people, there's this big self-care movement right now. And most people think of self-care as like bubble baths and face masks and all of these super relaxing things that we can do. And that's definitely true. Those are really helpful. I love a bubble bath. Um, and it's really about setting aside that specific time. I didn't mention this. I do have a couple of cats and they might join us right now. Mara, go away. Sorry. So really self-care is about setting a time, a time to take care of your body and your mind. So again, we're focusing on what do I really need? What's going to help me get through the day? And a lot of times if we're feeling really tired, we'll go through that forcing ourselves to kind of get through the day and like, oh, I just got to do this next thing and this next thing and this next thing. And then by the time we get home, we're so exhausted. Where if we do take some time to refuel ourselves, we'll actually probably be more productive because we're going to feel better. So as parents, as educators, as professionals, it's important for us to prioritize our mental and physical well-being so that we can model for our kids, hey, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to take care of yourself. Life is not all about productivity. So we kind of live in this culture that's about your results, right? Get A's, get good grades, you know, be the best at work, you know, work long, work hard. And while all of that's really great, right, in DBT we would say both, yes, work really hard and take care of yourself really hard. So we have to find that balance between how do I self-care and then how do I go to work? And we can't really go to work if we don't take care of ourselves. So there's lots of benefits to practicing self-care. So first we are gonna improve our focus and cognitive functioning. We're gonna be able to think better because we're not super stressed all the time. We're not burnt out. Um, I know for me, I noticed a lot of those feelings during COVID, like I was working a lot more and then I was working from home. So I didn't even get my like 30 minute drive where I listened to my favorite podcast. So I actually burnt out way faster because I was working so much and then I was so tired. And so I took a vacation, which is a little bit different than self-care every day. And I came back feeling a lot better. And I had all this like some guilt, right? Like, oh, how can I take this vacation? Like people are struggling, I have stuff to do. But what came, what happened was I came back and I was actually better. I was a more effective therapist. I was a more effective friend, family member, because I felt better, because I could focus and really engage. Obviously, we're gonna reduce our stress levels. We're gonna improve our connections and relationships, right? If we're not grumpy and tired and stressed, we're more fun to hang out with. We have more fun, we wanna connect more. Um, I know lots of people have Zoom burnout right now. Like, I don't wanna FaceTime another person, like I'm over it. When we engage in self-care, some of those things get a little bit easier. It also, again, models effective behaviors for kids. So they're gonna learn, oh, you know, if mom and dad can take a break, I can take a break too. And they are gonna learn balance through watching us. That's really how kids, especially the younger kids learn, by watching us do. And then creating a way for us to balance life struggles and self-care. So again, it's kind of, you know, bad things are gonna happen, stressful things are gonna happen. How do we manage those things and still take care of ourselves? So in DBT, we look at some pretty specific kinds of self-care. So like I said before, a lot of us probably think of self-care as self-soothing. So we're kind of thinking like looking at our five senses, which is a different DBT skill, right? So what makes you soothe through vision? What soothes me through taste or touch? And that's a really, really effective way to take care of ourselves too. So, you know, for me with vision, I might think about, you know, watching my favorite TV shows or looking at pictures of loved ones or looking at my pets. And, you know, for my hearing, I, you know, I like to listen to music and have afternoon dance parties. And so you can kind of go through your five senses and figure out what's gonna fit for you that's gonna work the best. So, you know, touch would be like fuzzy blankets and taking a bath or taking a nice shower. And so you can kind of find in your five senses, what's gonna soothe me, what's gonna make me feel better. And self-soothing is really effective, right? We see that a lot with little kids. That's one of our basic ways to, to take care of our emotions is to self-soothe and to soothe ourselves. But what really matters is self-care too, or I should say, and what matters is that we treat our emotional vulnerabilities. So I kind of already talked about burnout and feeling stressed. So our emotional vulnerabilities are anything that sets us up to be more vulnerable. So, you know, I kind of imagine it if my emotions and my day was like a bucket of water and I wake up in the morning and I wake up late. So I put a little bit of water into the bucket because, oh my gosh, I have to get ready and I only have an hour. Um, and I have to make breakfast and I have to do this. And so every little thing that kind of adds an emotion fills up my bucket. 
more and more and more, right? I stub my toe, it fills up my bucket. You know, I get a, I get a phone call that I get in a fight with my sister. That fills up my bucket a little bit more until maybe my bucket's overflowing. And so emotional vulnerabilities are how we start the day off. So we might not always start the day with an empty bucket. We might start the day feeling really tired or feeling stressed, not feeling good, just feeling sick. And so when we look at emotional vulnerabilities, it's us trying to empty our bucket out so that we can start the day on a fresh note. So when I think of emotional vulnerabilities, I'll often think in the short term, they're halt. So I have this in a different slide, but it's hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and sick. So, you know, we've talked about being hangry before, right? Um, so if you're hungry, it's probably not the most effective. When we eat and we eat enough, we give energy to our body, helps us focus, helps us to feel better. If I'm angry or I'm already emotionally just elevated, it's not gonna be helpful for me. I'm not gonna be able to focus because I'm already upset. You know, from zero to 10, 10 being the most upset I've ever been ever, and zero being neutral, once I get to a five, it's really, really hard for me to kind of regulate and get things done and take care of myself. So when I'm at a five, I have to figure out how to bring myself back down, five or higher. That's gonna be the point we're looking at. So if I wake up and I'm starting the day at a five, I really need to do my self-care in the morning so I can get myself down to a three or a four. And this might look like a game, like almost like ping pong, where you're going back and forth to like a three, then a five, then a three, but really trying to bring yourself down to where you're feeling more emotionally capable and stable. Sorry, Mar really wants to be a part of the picture today. You can't join us right now, stay right there. So um, the next one be lonely. So on one end we have angry or elevated, and then we have lonely or down. So when we're feeling really sluggish, feeling slow or feeling sad. That can be another emotional vulnerability, so it can still bring us up to a five, but not in the same way where we're feeling really escalated. We're feeling like you know, our heart's racing versus like, oh my God, I'm just so tired. So we wanna look at both of those emotions because they are big emotional vulnerabilities that can lead us to become more emotional down the road. And then we have tired, right? So if we don't feel good, we haven't gotten good sleep, it's gonna make us more likely to be vulnerable. We're just not feeling good. And actually research shows that we can have something called a sleep deficit. So for most of us, we need to get like eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. If I only got four or five last night, then I'm actually running a deficit, I'm negative in my sleep and I have to catch up. So the more and more I don't sleep, the long, bigger and bigger my deficit is, the more I have to practice catching up, making myself feel better, getting the sleep that I need. I mean, I'm definitely a person that struggles with staying asleep. So I often have to look at my deficit, try to go to bed earlier, try to engage in activities that will help fall asleep, really looking at, okay, what's gonna work for me? How am I gonna get my sleep to be better so I don't have this emotional vulnerability? And then stressed or sick. So this is kind of our first DBT skill, but making sure that we're feeling good from the very beginning. So taking care of those are our emotional vulnerabilities. In DBT, we really target those by using our please skill. So that looks like first treating physical illnesses. So we wanna, Again, take care of our bodies and our and our and everything about us. So if we're feeling sick, we're gonna notice that. We're actually not gonna say, oh, I gotta get over this, I gotta keep going. But notice, okay, what do I feel? What's going on in my body? Do I need to take medication that's prescribed to me? Do I need to go to the doctor? Do I need to take a day off? It's actually okay and important to take a day off if we don't feel good. Because if we push ourselves, then we often feel worse. I've definitely had that before. I'm like, no, I'm good. And then the next day I actually feel a lot worse than I did the day before. So again, making sure we're going to the doctor, even not just when we're sick, but also for our physicals, right? So I just started doing that this year. I was like, oh, I gotta practice what I preach. So go and get your annuals done so that you know that you're doing okay and that you're working good because doctors really are the only ones that can tell us that. And then working on balanced eating. So this is really about you know noticing your nutrition and noticing how food makes you feel. So at Oasis, we often follow an intuitive eating model, which dietitians can help you with. But this is just noticing how does food make me feel? If I'm eating potato chips and fries all of the time, it actually probably won't make my body feel good. Now, if I eat it sometimes, that probably does make my body feel good. So it's just about noticing and creating that balance in our lives of, okay, what am I eating? How does it make me feel? When I logged on, I had mentioned that I was drinking coffee to Jason and I was like, okay, that's actually gonna like probably escalate my nervousness a little bit because it's caffeine, right? And it like ramps you up. So I might have to notice how does caffeine affect me versus what I eat for breakfast. And just kind of, again, paying attention and being mindful of what happens when I eat 
and creating some balance between the foods that we love, the foods that are nutritious, the foods that are not so nutritious, but really, really good. Um, and then we wanna avoid mood altering substances. So we only wanna take medications that's prescribed to us. We are gonna avoid drugs and alcohol because they often don't make us feel better. You know, alcohol can disrupt your sleep pattern. Um, so it can affect our ability to make good decisions. So when we take mood altering substances, they alter our mood. So being mindful of that, that includes things like caffeine. So while in the morning it makes me feel really good for like 30 minutes, by three o'clock, I sometimes would get a headache. So I had to kind of step back from my caffeine intake to go, okay, actually this is not making me feel good. It's making me feel worse. And creating that balance for myself. Okay, what can I do instead besides this altering substance of caffeine? And then like I touched on before, making sure we get balanced sleep. So we, we'll kind of go through some tips on what we can do to help ourselves sleep better, what we can do to help kids sleep better, but really focusing on making sure that we're sleeping. I really think this is one of the most important vulnerabilities to focus on. It's a really easy one to get a little messed up, but it's really important. It's kind of setting the stage for us. You know, our brain processes a lot at night. We remember things better when we're getting enough sleep. So it's really important to look at our sleep. And then also engaging in exercise. So any sort of movement in your body actually feels pretty good. Sometimes we have judgments that get in the way or emotions that get in the way. So just like with balanced eating, it's about looking at what makes me feel good? What kind of movements do I like? Because our bodies really do want to move, especially with all of us staying home so often, we have to look at reasonably, how can I move? What's gonna make me feel good? And only really doing exercises that make us feel good versus bringing up judgments or discomfort. So this is kind of our please skill in general, where we're looking at, okay, again, here are my emotional vulnerabilities. Let me take it step by step. And sometimes we might run through these in just a moment. So you might hit, for me, I always hit that three o'clock slump. I'm like, okay, I don't feel good. What's happening? What is this that's going on right now? Have I eaten? Am I hungry? Am I upset? Does something happen and I haven't really had a time to think about it? You know, did I get enough sleep last night or am I feeling tired? Do I need to just walk around my house really quick and kind of shake things up and move my body? So you can kind of run through these and say, okay, What's my emotional number? Where am I at? And just notice, even in just a moment, as well as on a longer term scale, what's my emotional vulnerability that's causing me to feel this way? And that's the first step in self-care. If I can pinpoint what's really going on with me, then I can engage in activities that make me feel better. So when we go back to halts, if I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat something. If I'm angry or lonely, and I'm in that emotional state, I might engage in some of the self-care, self-soothe activities. If I'm tired, I'm gonna look at my sleep patterns. Maybe I'm just gonna to go to bed earlier. Maybe I'll take a nap if I have time. And then if I'm stressed or sick, do I need to take care of that biggest physical illness? Will exercise actually make my stress or emotions go down? So you can kind of match my emotional vulnerability with the please skill, even in just five minutes, just kind of running through the list and creating those goals in the long term. So with specifically children, we're looking at, you know, the little ones, maybe six to 10, how we can kind of help them get engaged in these sort of things. These kids are gonna need a little bit more direction because they're younger, right? They also are able to make decisions for themselves and they wanna be involved in the process. Um, and they're probably looking for you to follow and they're really looking for connection at this age. So how can we connect with them and promote their self-care? So with physical illnesses, Kids at this age really do still want to be nurtured, right? They want to be taken care of. They want the Band-Aid, even though they don't actually have a cut. Um, I was a big kid like that. I loved Band-Aids. It was like stickers. So making sure we attend to their symptoms. Oh my gosh, you don't feel good. Tell me what's going on. Help me understand. Um, if you're homeschooling, you do want to really encourage them to take breaks. You know, it, our brains really don't want to focus for hours on end. They want to be able to take a break especially with computers. We really only should be looking at computers for 20 to 25 minutes and then taking a little bit of a break. So it's normal for your kid to not want to focus. It's a really typical behavior. And so we can encourage, yeah, it's super hard to focus. Like, let's get our wiggles out. Let's take a break. And then we can bring ourselves back. And then you're teaching them that process of, yeah, you know, sometimes I have to shake it off and then I can bring myself back. Um, especially with little kids, you know, making sure you really validate and work on hygiene. So maybe you wanna be there at bath time. Maybe you wanna do something fun. Maybe we brush our teeth together. Maybe we do something that's gonna promote this and we're doing it together. Um, you can also create some visual aids at this age 
or they might have a little checklist or they might have a sticker they put on so that they're feeling motivated to go, oh my gosh, yes, I get to put my sticker because I brushed my teeth today all by myself. So we're also working on building that independence, even if we're working with connection. So as, as far as physical illness too, um, a connection-based activity that I really love is to do a hand massage. Um, kids really look for connection. Specifically, they say um, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes right after school, and 10 minutes before bed. So if you could build in self-care activities in those times, and again, it's only 10 minutes, then you can really, really bolster your kid's confidence and bolster your relationship. So my favorite one before bed, so this also could connect with sleep, is to do a hand massage, which is pretty simple. You just get lotion, your favorite lotion. Um, you can encourage them to pick out what they want to do, and you'll just rub each other's hands. So you'll work on their hands, and then they'll work on yours, and then you'll go to bed. So that's one of my favorites, again, and that's a lot of tension, right? There's tension in our hands when we're stressed. And so this is a connection activity, a soothing activity, and it can kind of take care of whatever pain we might have. Um, so that's for physical illnesses, for balanced eating, really letting your kids be helpers and really making sure from the very beginning we avoid making judgments about food. So we're not saying, oh, this is so bad for me. I really shouldn't eat cake. We're really just encouraging that all foods are good for you. Some maybe are more nutritious than others, but all, all food is good. And letting your kids be helpers. So giving them tasks in the kitchen so that they're involved. Again, right, this is all about creating connections. Um, if you're at the grocery store, helping them, you know, having them help you pick a rainbow of food. How can we get all of the colors and what's your favorite? So that they feel more connected and more, you know, courageous maybe in what they're trying and they're getting to select it and be a part of the process. Um, helping them to make snacks. Do you guys remember when we used to, my mom used to make those like celery with peanut butter and raisins and it looked like a little caterpillar and it's like so simple, but it was so fun and I remember that. And then with little kids, I, you know, I often hear parents talk about when they have big tantrums and big emotions and oh my God, what's wrong? Sometimes we literally just have to ask, hey, when was the last time you ate? You know, is this your emotional vulnerability where you're really hungry right now? Actually, you do need a snack. So especially with food, we kind of want to try to turn our no's into yeses. And almost always we're trying to turn into some sort of yes for connections. So yes, you can have a snack. Could you wait 15 minutes? Or yes, you can have something before dinner. You know, pick something from this basket where we're keeping really nutritious or maybe even small snacks, like protein-based snacks. So we want to make sure that it's a yes because they may actually be hungry and they do need a little snack. Maybe it's okay that they don't eat all of their dinner because they're hungry right now. So creating that balance and, create, and not creating fear with food, letting them be engaged and in control a little bit. Also, you know, as parents, we get to kind of decide what is their control? What do we have control over? So we might offer two options of food so they don't get all of the choices in the world, but they do feel like they're making choices. For a balanced sleep with kids, making sure you do stick to an earlier bedtime. So you might want to consider putting them to bed at eight or nine, kind of seeing, and you might even give them options. We don't want to be too strict. We want to have some flexibility. So, you know, if they're in the middle of watching one of their favorite shows or a movie, you know, we might say, okay, when this is over, you have to go to bed, it's bedtime, and let's go do our 10 minutes together. And that's also kind of rewarding bedtime, right? Oh, we have our special 10 minutes right before bed. And then they'll get excited for that. So making bedtime fun, reading books, maybe watching videos, but you wanna be mindful of screen time before bed. Again, just doing some sort of connection, even if it's a hand massage, even if it's just talking, something before bed that not only rewards us going to bed on time, but also creates those connections for you. Encouraging a dark room as much as you can is really important. That's important for everybody. So I used to be really guilty of sleeping with the TV on and I've worked on that, kind of putting a timer on, making sure it turns off because if we leave it on, it keeps our brain awake. So any sort of dimmer lights, usually red lighting or like that orange night light is better than any sort of blue light. So blue, purples, those are actually gonna keep the brain awake. So just making sure we're encouraging a dark, cool room so your kid's not just complaining that it's hot, it also is really hard to sleep when it's hot. Our body temperature naturally do drops at night, so we wanna try to mimic that before we go to bed. Um, if your kid struggles with separation, that's also where this 10 minute of connection time might be really helpful because you'll be able to connect and then slowly leave the room. So it kind of depends on the separation anxiety you might have to look at a little bit deeper, but this can help with that. And then finally, encouraging movement with your kids. Maybe taking walks together, playing together, doing some sort of movement, um, doing a yoga video. There's tons and tons of videos on YouTube that you guys could do for five or 10 minutes, even before bed, like we've already talked about, or after school when they have all these, all these wiggles, all these energy to do. So I really like all the Go Noodle videos. Those are really cool, if you, and they're on YouTube, they're free. 
Um, and this is about asking them what they might want to do, giving them some choices. They may have a really, really fun game. I used to have a client who every week we would dance to the Descendants soundtrack. And it was the same song every week. But we danced to it every week and then we ended with a bunch of deep breathing and it was so much fun if you can kind of let your silly out and it felt really good for her and we were engaging in movement so kids are pretty pretty much always rambunctious anyway but we can kind of encourage and give choices and make sure that we're involved i think with younger kids that's going to be the most important is that you're involved so for preteens and teens you're looking at Similar things, right? Preteens and teens, as much as they are moving towards their peers, kind of bringing themselves away from you, they are still looking for your connection and for you to hold the space for them. So we are normalizing that sometimes they will be in their room more and normalizing, okay, we can still build connections at this age. It doesn't have to be disconnected. So again, this is really big, encouraging your kids to share their symptoms with you. So we don't want to just invalidate it right off the bat. Oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. You know, letting them kind of share and then validating, yeah, it's really hard when we go to school and we have a headache. What could we do? What do you think's going on in the mornings? Um, encouraging mental health days, you know, part of physical mental illness, right? They're all kind of connected. So if we need to take a break for a day, we could take a break for a day, as long as we're creating balance with what that could look like. So, and just really encouraging them to be mindful of their body, be mindful of what doesn't feel good, being able to share and nurture them when they don't feel good, and then encouraging checkups with doctors. So, you want to go, you want to make sure you're getting your annual. Um, really having conversations with kids about mood altering substances. So talking about drugs and alcohol doesn't actually make kids want to go try drugs and alcohol. Avoiding the conversation can. So be willing to have courageous conversations, talk about it, answer their questions because they're gonna hear about it anyway at school. There's gonna be kids that are probably already doing it at school. So we're not gonna be able to hide that from them, but we can have conversations about them. A really great way to do that is to have family dinners. And again, this is kind of that check-in. So if maybe we don't have time for those 10 minutes after school, maybe we're still at work, having family dinners can build those connections. Um, and then making sure that you monitor kids' caffeine intake. So I know a lot of teenagers that drink way too many monsters, which I think are gross, but they drink a lot of monsters and that would really impact their anxiety, especially because the caffeine will really escalate things. So again, just be willing to engage with conversations about drugs and alcohol without shaming. So while it's normal for kids to be curious and want to understand, that's why we have to talk about it. Otherwise, they're going to go figure it out on their own. Um, same thing, we want to encourage balanced eating and sleep. So we really want to look for eight or nine hours of sleep. Teenagers do often go to bed later. That's natural. Their body clock's a little bit different than us. But really, you know, validating for them, okay, make sure that you are getting enough sleep. Let them have a little bit of control over when they go to bed. But we also want to make sure that we're saying, okay, but make sure you're getting enough sleep. How much sleep are you getting? The screen time before bed is also really important here. So ideally, we want to not be on our phones or watching TV 30 minutes before bed. So we also need to model that behavior. I'm sure we all have our favorite shows. My parents love to watch The Voice, for example, and then they go to bed. So they're actually not modeling, right? They need to kind of shift their behaviors too, where it's going to be hard for us to fall asleep if we've just watched TV. We need to do some sort of activity after that to disconnect our brain. Um, and then asking your kids what they want to do as far as eating and sleeping is also important. Um, and being a part of their sleep routine. So again, it's really about connecting with them. Maybe you make sure you're staying good night, no matter how old they are, because they, they still want to be connected to you, even if they're pulling away. It's important to remember as parents of preteens and teens that you're kind of moving from being the manager to being the consultant. So I'm not telling you exactly when to go to bed. I'm not telling you exactly what to eat, but I am going to consult with you on what your options are, on what we can do together, on what kind of snacks you want, what kind of food you might want, so that they are still getting more control and more independence and we're not controlling everything for them. So now we're consulting because we wanna build them up to make their own individual choices. So that's really it for them. Again, sleep is really important. I know lots of kids take naps too. Teens are really notorious for naps. Really, it has always shocked my kids. You really should only be napping for 20 to 30 minutes, any longer than that, and it's gonna disrupt your sleep pattern. So I do encourage my kids to take, you know, set a timer, make sure they set an alarm, because even if they're tired, they're actually gonna feel worse if they sleep longer than 30 minutes. And then encouraging exercise. Make sure that it's activities that they like and try to do it together. I have learned a lot of TikTok dances, partially on my own and partially with some of my kids. So, but that's a fun way to get engaged in activities that they actually like. Or being willing to play sports outside with them, even if it's only for 10 minutes, that's really all you need to try to target is 10 to 15 minutes a day. So if they wanna go outside and play basketball, even if you suck at basketball, that's what you're gonna do. 
be curious about what their activities are and get engaged in what they like, and then they're more likely to include you in the story. And when I was in high school, I was in the color guard and my parents would just sit outside and watch me spin. But it was so great and so validating for them to be out there. So even if we're just watching, at least we're still there and we're still connected and they're still engaging in movement. As parents, again, we wanna practice what we preach. So all of the skills that we just talked about, they're the same for us. So we're gonna to try to avoid mood altering substances. We're gonna take care of ourselves when we're sick. We're gonna be mindful of food. We're gonna to try to eat the rainbow, eat what we need, maybe speak to a diet dietitian if we aren't sure what our dietary needs are and making sure that we're, again, we're not judging food. So kids are listening from as young as six, probably even younger, they're aware of what we're saying about food. So we wanna avoid any judgmental comments and, and any guilt. It's okay for us to enjoy treats, right? It's not I should or shouldn't. It's what do I really need right now? What makes my body feel good? And that also includes making comments about weight or body. So kids are pretty sensitive about this and they're gonna learn from your messages. So making sure that you're spending validating comments about food and body and movement and exercise. And really making time in the day. I know it's hard to do that, but really just five minutes, even five minutes of mindfulness can give us the same benefits as Tibetan monks. So if we just find five minutes, and I know we have it because I definitely scroll on Instagram for at least 10, we'll be able to see a lot of mental health benefits and self-care. So it doesn't have to be a 45 minute bubble bath or a face mask or you know, going for a really, really long walk. If we can do something for just five minutes, we can see a lot of benefits and the same thing for our kids. Um, I do have some kids that are really like, I don't have any time. So I even encourage like taking a mindful moment in your shower and really just like getting connected with your body, feeling how the water feels because it's self-soothing and you have to shower. So you'll be in there for probably five minutes. So you can kind of use that as your time too. But I would encourage you to invest in some other activities. And then promoting exercise too. So I used to be really guilty of like, oh my God, I just don't want to work out. It's not my self-care skill. I really like to read or engage in art. So exercise wasn't my like top priority, but I really tried to focus on exercises that I enjoy because then there's less shame and guilt or frustrations, right? So I'm going to go like do exercises based in dance because those feel good for me. And I'm going to be mindful of what I'm feeling. If I wake up and I'm so exhausted because I didn't sleep well, maybe I'm not going to force myself to exercise because I'm probably not going to get a good workout in anyway if I'm grumpy. But being able to show our kids that we value movement and we value all of this balance is really important. So again, you don't want to be engaging in something, asking your kid to do something that you're not doing yourself. I think that that's really important. Now we might do it differently, but I'm still doing the same thing that I'm asking you to do. And then you can encourage this on a family level too. So creating a structure for your kids. Kids, no matter what age, really thrive with structure and stability. They need to know what to expect. So we have to find that balance between structure and stability and flexibility. So with teenagers, we're giving them, hey, I need you to have this done by this day. We're setting deadlines. We're giving them the flexibility to decide when they're going to get that done. Again, that's consulting, right? Hey, you need to finish this by this time. It's kind of like what our bosses do. Hey, we need this by this day, but they don't always, hopefully, micromanage every step of the way of what we're doing. That's especially important with teenagers. With younger kids, we might give a little bit more structure. This is when we're going to do it at this time, and even using those visual schedules so kids know when to expect. As a family, you can think of activities to do all together. Maybe it's camping trip. Maybe it is doing like a family walk, family bike ride, a family yoga session. Maybe it's cooking together. Um, my family does a lot of pizza nights together. And that's a really, really great connection activity, right? Because you kind of have to work the dough and make all the toppings together. And it can be super fun and can encourage like a lot of nutrition too with putting vegetables and all this different stuff on your pizzas. If you don't know how to make pizza dough, Publix sells it and they sell it rolled out for you too. So you have some options and adding it to your calendar. So they know when to expect it. It's not something we're springing on them, but they also are able to expect it. So it's a little bit of both, right? They're knowing when it's happening. We have some flexibility and everyone's kind of prepared for it. And then encouraging time outside. It's been super easy to stay inside nowadays. So even if we're just kind of sitting outside for a few minutes, even if we are just going for even some drives with the windows down, can feel good and engaging in just those shorter activities. So I already said, I like to do afternoon dance parties. That feels good to break up the monotony for me. I have lots of little kids that love that. Encouraging spa days or self-care days, reading together, even being willing to listen to their music, give them the aux cord in the car, let them share with you because then you're gonna connect more. So these can be short activities, five minutes, 10 minutes, or they could be whole weekends. 
and you can kind of talk with your family, especially with older kids, what do they want to do? What's going to work for them? So I'm still setting the limit of, hey, we are going to go do this together. What works for you? What are your ideas? So they feel like they're involved in the process. And then these are just some extra tips. So I've already talked a lot about this. Before we can change behaviors, before we can get into emotions and have kids share, we really have to feel connected to them. They really wanna be able to trust you and feel like they have the space to share. So we really wanna open that space. This is hard with teenagers because sometimes they don't use it, but they need to know that the space is there. So if I ask you how your day is, oh, it's fine. You know, I could maybe ask a couple more questions and I wanna keep them open-ended, but if they don't wanna share, I'm not gonna force them. They just need to know that I am available. Making sure that you're giving kids choices. They wanna be reasonably involved in what's happening. So with little kids, you're kind of deciding the choices. With older kids, hey, what do you think would work? What are some of your ideas? Being really, really, really curious because they're thinkers for themselves and they actually do know what they need. So parents, we know what kids need too. We know our kids really well and they know themselves really well. So we have to be curious to learn about them as they grow. Making sure that you do explain the why um, because I said so never really feels good for anybody. So we really need to be able to explain what's the purpose of this? What's the benefit? Um, I feel that way at work, you know, sometimes if my boss asks me to do something and they don't really explain why, it's hard for me to be motivated to do it. So I need to reinforce, hey, if we all do yoga together, it's gonna be really, really good for our family. And we probably won't even fight as much because we'll all be calmed down right before dinner, right? So we can kind of reinforce for them, why are these things important? And ask them, you know, what do you think? I wonder why you don't think it's important. Again, and willing to be curious about what's maybe their resistance. Being willing to negotiate and be flexible, give to get, is this the hill I wanna die on? Am I able to be flexible with this choice or not? And again, what's your option? What are you thinking? Let's problem solve together versus fighting and spending more time probably arguing than getting to a solution. Um, also, it's important to remember that kids and teens, their brain is not fully developed. It's not really fully developed till like 24 or 25. So they may actually just forget and it's so frustrating but we can help them. So we can use visual aids, especially if you have kids with maybe some developmental delays, they're really, really, really gonna use the visual aids. We can provide gentle reminders, leave little hints, you know, might leave like a postcard in your lunch. Um, we don't wanna nag, but we can remind them, hey, I just wanted to check in on this, or, and we might only do that once or twice to kind of see what happens, but some kids really won't remember and they're gonna need more directions. And we can help them learn to be organized. So we can encourage, you know, using a planner and making it fun and making it their own. So like I always encourage kids to buy a journal that they really, really like, you know, not just like a composition notebook. And if you do buy one, let's decorate it, but making sure that they feel engaged and excited and are learning how to organize and get ready. And then we've talked about this a little bit too, making sure that you avoid judgments, making sure it's, the, it's their choice, it's safe and effective, then that's fine. We don't want to judge their ideas, even if they're not effective. You might say, okay, I see what you're saying. Do you think anything else could work because I'm kind of worried about this? And just being willing and curious because your kids are smart. You raise them, they know what they're doing. They know what they need. So we can ask them and we probably have ideas of our own. So creating that balance of what I think will work and what you think will work, usually you'll come up with a good solution. This is just a little bit, obviously, like Jason said, like a shameless plug. This was just one DBT skill, there's a bunch. So we teach this at Therapeutic Oasis. Um, our teens have their own group, and then we also have a parent component, so this is really helpful. You know, DBT is going to help us learn to manage and regulate emotions, learn to manage distress, learn about relationships, increase self-awareness and self-confidence and self-acceptance. So this is just one example of a DBT skill. I don't think I know how to stop sharing my screen. I'll like take that. care of it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alyssa. I really appreciate the uh, the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I don't have any questions from the audience just yet, but I have a couple of my own. Uh, and starting back from the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about catching up on sleep, and and mentioned that like if you you know got an hour less one night, you may need an hour more. Like, how much does that accumulate? It can accumulate a lot, actually. So we really do need to be mindful. You know, our bodies are also very resilient. Um, but it can accumulate a lot. So really, again, being, you just need to be mindful of like how much sleep am I getting and seeing if you can adjust when you're not feeling good. When you don't, when you feel tired, you might have a sleep deficit. If you feel good, 
then you're probably balancing out a little bit. And everybody needs a different number of sleep. So some of us need like 10 hours, some of us only need six. So you have to really learn to listen to your body, which is part of what DBT, you know, focuses on too, that mindful awareness of, okay, how do I really feel? Am I tired or am I sick? Kind of learning those things, but it can, it can add up. So that's why it's so important. I remember once I uh, saw a hypnotist and he talked about naps and he was saying the same thing as you said that, you know, 20 to 30 minutes is all after that you actually, you know, fall into deeper REM sleep and it, it will affect you at night. Um, but he, he mentioned that a 20 minute nap could be the equivalent of an hour and a half of sleep. So would that be like helping you catch up? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to take naps. It's just about creating the balance and not sleeping too long because then you will fall into that deeper sleep, which our body knows how to naturally wake up from. So even like with coffee, I try not to drink coffee within 20 to 30 minutes of waking up because my body is naturally going to produce, I think it's cortisol that wakes you up so I can drink coffee after, but we want to allow our body to go through its natural process too. So yeah, 20, 20 minutes can actually make us feel better without disrupting us from deeper sleep. Now, I, I have to take issue a bit with your recommendation to avoid alcohol because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I am an adult and I, I definitely need my my uh, my uh, bourbon on a Friday night. Um, but uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, how important is that? Where does that come into play? You know, what is safe or what is acceptable versus like where should you draw the line? Yeah. Um I also like a glass of red wine, you know, that's part of my, my self-care too. Um, I also just learned to make like chocolate martinis and that feels fun for me to make. So it's always about just creating balance and noticing how does this make me feel? You know, do I drink so much that I don't wake up feeling good? Um, but creating balance in our lives is really important. So we don't want to engage in where we only binge drink, right? And we go on like only Friday nights and we drink so much that we don't feel good the next day. We don't want to maybe never drink because it depends on what we need. So it's just about creating balance and being aware. If, but alcohol can disrupt your sleep. So it's just about being mindful of that. You know, if I'm drinking and I notice that I'm not sleeping well the next day and I can't sleep in, then you know, it is going to make it harder to actually fall into deeper sleep. But it's really about being mindful of your body. Does this feel good for me or does it not? Got it. And can you talk a little bit more about your emotional number and how you, can, how you rate that, you know, when you're, when you're looking at it internally? Yeah. So again, like this is like that mindfulness piece. So we need to be aware of our thoughts, the feelings and the body sensations that all add up to an emotion. So an emotion is not just sadness. Sometimes it's our judgments or our thoughts about something, or maybe it's pressure on my chest. So we need to kind of know all levels of it. The more awareness we have, the more we can rate our feelings. So I usually use zero to 10, which 10 is like the worst you've ever felt. And zero is calm. So I don't even go all the way to happy because sometimes that's not realistic. Just because I'm not sad doesn't mean I'm happy. But am I neutral? Am I calm? Am I more in control? So, you know, as we gain more awareness, we'll know what I look like at a two and a four and a five. Usually people know what their zero looks like and their 10 looks like, and then maybe their eight. And then, so we're kind of trying to build awareness like five and up, and even a little bit before five. So we know, okay, when am I getting to that place where I'm not in control anymore and my emotions leading the journey? So sometimes the metaphor I'll use is, if my emotion was in the car at a five or higher, it's in the driver's seat. It's taking me wherever it wants to go. It's in control at maybe like four to six. It's in the passenger seat. It does have a lot of control. It can change the music. It could pull the car in a direction, but I'm still driving. And then maybe four or lower, it's in the back seat where I can hear it and it's there, but it's not in control. I am. And so that's a good way to check in too. like what's really in control, my feeling or me. Because they can be different. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, and I, I, I really found your recommendation of the hand massage really interesting and never something I never thought about or heard before. Uh, do you have any other recommendations in that same realm? Uh, are you talking specifically for little ones? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So for little ones, it, it almost can seem a little silly, but sometimes even like being able to feed them, no matter how old they are, is a great connection activity. And it can be silly. It could be with candy. Um, uh, I've worked a lot with like, if you're really, really a busy parent, sometimes we'll create a little mailbox and kids can leave messages for you. You can leave messages for them. 
Um, and if they struggle with separation anxiety, then you could work too on creating some sort of like special goodbye and hello so that they feel connected to you even when you leave. So they're gonna know what to expect when they see you again. So I've had lots of kids that I've had handshakes with and it's just a way to kind of end things um, and they still feel really connected. Oh, I, I, I uh, play like little games with my kids right before bed every night. We yeah. I have different games I play with my son and my daughter and like the little things we say to each other. Uh, it's always something I think they like don't want to go to bed until I do that <laughs> yeah because they expect it and they know it's going to be fun and I get time with dad and I right. like that that it's different for them too because that's important every kid is different yeah um and then um you, you were talking a bit about screen time before bed um and, and um and then you also mentioned like if they were watching a show and you're like you say yes like it's bedtime when you finish the show so do you see a is there a difference uh in your mind between screen time on the tv versus like an ipad or a phone or is it you know the same thing you know how, how do you differentiate that yeah it's all the same because it's all you know it's all blue light um i think it's easier for kids to get really this is just like my noticing not like any research i can confirm with this but yeah. Kids, I think, get a little bit more sucked into like their iPads and YouTubes and game. Then I think TV is easier to break from because there's natural breaks in shows versus like that continuous loop. Um, but it is so important to kind of limit that screen time either way. You know, so really targeting like 20 to 30 minutes. That's why I think sometimes it's a good transition. Um, this doesn't work for everybody, but even if you do bath time right before bed, especially with little ones, um, teenagers are pretty resistant to this obviously, um, and I use my phone at night too, so I get it, and it's just kind of about being able to encourage that disconnection as much as possible, um, because it does keep them up. Now, with teens, sometimes you wanna look for that natural consequence, so, okay, fine, you can keep your phone, but if you're waking up tired every morning, why do you think that is? Maybe staying on TikTok till 3 a.m., that's probably why. So, which I've done, and I get it, so we kind of have to be flexible, but it's, you know, with teens especially being able to kind of notice, hey, you mentioned to me that you were up super late every night with your phone. What do you think about that? So, cause we'll notice if they're tired, right? Um, yeah, but uh, the, the phone is, is a tough one. I, uh, I, I, as much as I try personally to limit it before bed, it's like always like right before, let me just check one more thing, you know, mm -hmm. you get a text and then it's like, well, while I'm looking, I might as well check my email. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not necessary at you know at 10 o'clock at night but it's just you yeah. can't help it sometimes and self-care uh, is also boundaries so yeah you're right like what's what's the reason i have this urge to check my email and and asking kids so i had a kid once that really needed their phone and them and their parents used to fight about it all the time and it, what really was is that she didn't like to go to bed without sound and so we were like okay let's problem solve what could work without you sitting on your phone and so then, you know, we got a noise machine and she was able to like put music on that helped her fall asleep. And that's why it's important to be curious. Like what's so important about this that you're putting up such a big fight? Right, I, I'll tell you, we started using a sound machine uh, a couple of years ago and I, I never thought like anything of it. And I've always been a good sleeper, but when I put that on, man, I just knocks me out. <laughs> <laughs> And I think my son sleeps with his on every night now. He just has a, a, a you know, a Google, you know, a little thing and a speaker in his room. And he uses that, turns it on every night before bed. Um, so la last question, unless we get any more from the, the audience, um, is how do you recommend parents to talk about uh, drugs and alcohol with their teenagers? Yeah, I think it's about being, you know, being courageous. That's why I call it courageous conversations because they can be so uncomfortable for us because we're kind of nervous, but it really doesn't increase the likelihood for them to, to engage in those behaviors. That's true for, for suicide or self-injury as well. If we are talking about it, it actually doesn't increase their likelihood. What it really does is opens the space for them to say, it's okay to talk about this here. So, you know, if there's something on the news and you can kind of draw that connection, or if they mention something at school, you can draw that connection, but you can also ask about it. Hey, like, have you heard about any drugs? Like what's going on at school? I know, I know that that's there, like it's there, even if we're at the best private school in the world or, you know, we do our best to shield them from it, kids find it. And so being just even online or in TV shows, they're going to see it. And so it's okay to just ask about it. I would usually say like, you know, have, have you heard about any drugs and just being really upfront about it because if we're dancing around it, then they don't, they think it's not okay to talk about, but it is, it's important to talk about it. Right. Well, Alyssa, thank you so much for today's uh, presentation. It was really informative and interesting.
Um, so everyone knows we did record today's presentation. Uh, I will have it up on our website uh, probably this afternoon. Uh, the, the link to that will be sent out to everybody. Um, and it's, it's up on our website now. Even if you go to scorewebinars.com, you'll find the link to all the recorded previous um, webinars in this series, as well as every other webinar we've done uh, in the last several months and even before that. Coming up in September, we're going to have our Florida Dozens webinar, what it takes to get admitted to Florida State University. Our State University in Florida, I'm sorry. Uh, and this is traditionally our most, uh, our busiest webinar of the year. So we're, we're, we're hoping to uh, to officially break 200 people online uh, for this one this year, uh, watching synchronously, not including the, the asynchronous watching after the fact. Um, and that registration page will be up pretty soon, uh, probably later this week. And uh, there'll be emails going out on that as well. So again, everybody, thank you so much for coming today. Alyssa, thank you again. And uh, stay safe, stay well, wear your masks, and have a great day. Have a great rest of your week. Bye. Thank you.